Grace and peace be unto you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed King, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. This is Brother James Lawson from Echo Keek, Maryland. We are about to start a new study, and the study will be on the book of Isaiah, the prophet. And since this is a new study, I will always start off with a summary of what this book is all about. Now, what does the word prophet mean? The meaning of the word prophet, as you see, first of all, let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9. It says, Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. So the first part of the word prophet, the pra, pro or pra, means in place of. And the second part, fet, which Greek word is hemi, means to speak. So a prophet is one who speaks in place of another. God tells Moses in Exodus chapter 7 verse 1, I have made thee a god unto Pharaoh, and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Because Aaron was supposed to speak in place of Moses to Pharaoh, because Moses had a stuttering problem in the beginning. Prophecy is a matter of foretelling and declaring the future, which can only be by the direct inspiration of God. But when you get to the central message of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah uh, 6 and 1 deals with a throne. And it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. So number one, it deals with a throne. But number two, it deals with a lamb in the midst of the throne. If you look at the book of Revelations, chapter 7, verse 17, and chapter 4, verse 2, uh, chapter 7, verse 17 says, For the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Revelation, chapter 4, verse 2, says, Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. Now, Isaiah is Old Testament prophet that is prophesying about what's going to happen many years later when Jesus come, and then was spoken of again in Revelation after Jesus ascended to be with the Father. After some time, he had left, and when the church was thriving in the early days. So the structure of the book of Isaiah, number one, the judgment of God, God's government. That's chapter 1 through 39. And in these chapters, we will find the judgment on Judah and Jerusalem, chapters 1 through 12. The judgment on nations, chapter 13 uh, through 27. Warnings and promises, chapter 28 through 35. And historical, uh, chapters 36 to 39. But then you get into the comfort of God, God's grace, chapter 40 to 66. And in the comfort of God, we will just discuss Jehovah and idols in chapter 40 to 48, the coming Messiah, chapter 49 to 57, and the final restoration and promised glory, chapter 58 through 66. Now, Isaiah's prophetic perspective was given divine revelation concerning prophetic points. Number one, under the judgment section, chapter one through 39, we will see Isaiah saw things to come in his own time, and Isaiah saw the coming captivity of Babylon. And that's Isaiah chapter 39, verse 6, which reads, Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house and that which thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, saith the Lord. Now, this was before the captivity of Babylon. So under the judgment section, that's what we're going to discuss. But number two, under the comfort section, chapter 40 to 66, we will discuss how Isaiah saw the coming of Christ, both the first, chapter 7, and the second, chapter 11, and chapter 61. Isaiah saw also and proclaimed finally the millennium and the new heavens and the new earth in chapter 66. So how to remember the 66 chapters of Isaiah? This right here will help you out. Number one. Isaiah has 66 chapters, and our Bible has 66 books. Isaiah has two main divisions. The first division has 39 chapters, 
and the second division has 27 chapters. The Bible has two main parts, Old Testament, 39 books, New Testament, 27 books. See the parallel? Number four, the prevailing, prevailing note in the first division of Isaiah is judgment. So the prevailing note in the Old Testament of the Bible is law. Number six, the prevailing note in the second division of Isaiah is comfort. And number seven, the prevailing note in the Bible is grace, comfort and grace. And grace is spoken of in the 27 books of the New Testament. And that's one way to break down how to remember Isaiah. Just compare it to the Bible. 66 chapters, Bible has 66 books. Isaiah has 39 chapters in the first division and 27 chapters in the second division. And the Bible has 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. The 39 books in the Old Testament of Isaiah deals with judgment. And the 39 books in the Old Testament deals with the law. The 27 chapters in Isaiah deals with comfort. And the 27 chapters of the New Testament deals with grace. So let's go to now Isaiah chapter 1. The corruption prevailing among the Jews would be in verse 1 through 9. And there will be some severe censors, verse 10 through 15. Exhortation to repentance, 16 to 20. The state of Judah is lamented with gracious promises of the gospel times, and that's 21 to 31. Let's just get into it. We will start off at the King James, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1 through 6, and it's dealing with rebellion of God's people. Here says, The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, in the days of Uzziah, King Uzziah, King Jothan, King Ahaz, and King Hezekiah. These were all kings of Judah. Isaiah says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. So verse 1 and 2 starts off with the vision of the prophet Isaiah that God gave to Isaiah, who was the son of Amos. And the vision was concerning the kingdom of Judah and its capital being Jerusalem. And what Isaiah saw, in other words, what was revealed to him by God was during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah during the time that they all reigned as kings. So Isaiah said, Hear, O heavens, and listen, O earth. For the Lord has spoken, I have reared and brought up sons, but they have rebelled against me and have broken away. So when you go to verse 3, it says, The ox knoweth his owner, and the donkey his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. God says the ox instinctively knows its owner, and the donkey its master's feeding trough. But Israel does not know God as Lord, as owner of all. Israel was his people, and they do not understand. So verse 4 says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backwards. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. So verse 4 and 5 speaks of the nation as being a sinful nation, a people loaded down with wickedness. In other words, with sin, with injustice, with wrongdoings, offsprings of evildoers, sons who behave corruptly. It says they have rejected the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel, provoking him to anger. They have turned away from God. So then Isaiah continues on and say, why should you be stricken and, pun and punished again since no change results from it? No matter how much God punishes you, you're not going to change. He says, you only continue to rebel. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint and sick. So the verse six says, from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. What is Isaiah saying? From the sole of the foot, even to the head, there is nothing healthy in the nation's body of nation of Israel. He says only bruises, welts and raw wounds, not pressed out or bandaged, nor softened with oil as a remedy. Bruises, welts and raw wounds. So then you go to verse seven. Verse 7 says, The country is desolate, your cities are burnt with fire, your land 
Strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. So verse 7 through 9. Isaiah is saying that the lands, they lie desolate because of the disobedience of the people. And he says their cities are burnt with fire and their fields, strangers are devouring them in their very presence. Isaiah says it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. He says the daughters of Zion, which means the daughters of Jerusalem, is left like a deserted shelter in a vineyard, like a watchman's hut in a cucumber field like a besieged city, isolated, surrounded by devastation. In verse 9, it says, If the Lord of hosts had not left them a few survivors, they would be like Sodom and they would be like Gomorrah. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah when God rained down fire and burnt down the whole city? He says, God has had enough. So verse 10, he says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Still comparing them to Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who have required this at your hand, to tread at my courts. Amen. So Isaiah, the prophet, is saying, hear the word of the Lord. He's speaking to the rulers of Jerusalem because he says, you rulers of another Sodom. Listen to the law and instructions of our God, you people of another Gomorrah, because you are like Sodom and Gomorrah. He says, what are your multiplied sacrifices to God without your repentance? He says, the Lord says that God himself has had enough of their burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed cattle without their obedience. And God takes no pleasure in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats offered without repentance. In verse 12, it says, When you come to appear before God, who requires this of you? This trampling of God's temple courts by your sinful feet. That's what you're doing when you come before God and you offering up your alms or offering up your sacrifices or offering even of offering up your prayers if you're not coming with a spirit of obedience and humility god don't want that so verse 13 through 18 says bring no more vain oblations incense is an abomination unto me the new moons and sabbaths the calling of assemblies i cannot away with it is iniquity even the solemn meeting wow he says, your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean, put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well, seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge the fatherless, plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He is still prophesying to the people. Isaiah is still prophesying to the people with the words of God. The Lord has said to him, and he's saying that God is saying, do not bring worthless offerings again. Uh, your incense is repulsive to God. Their new moon and Sabbath observances, the calling of assemblies together. God cannot endure wickedness, meaning he cannot endure their sin, their injustice, their wrongdoings, and the squalor of the festive assembly. He says God hates the hypocrisy of the new moon festivals and their appointed feasts. They have become a burden to God and God is weary of bearing them. God says, when you spread out your hands in prayer, pleading for God's help, God will not hide his eyes from them, even though they offer many prayers and God will not be listening. Their hands are full of blood. So he tells them to wash themselves, make themselves clean and get their evil deeds out of God's sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do good. 
seek justice, rebuke the ruthless, defend the fatherless, plead for the rights of the widow in court. Now, this is God telling them what he wants them to do. Stop doing what you're doing. This is what you need to do. And then God says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. Now, there was a legend among the rabbis that on the day of atonement, a scarlet woolen thread was tied to the door of the temple. And when the scapegoat reached the wilderness in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 10, if the sins of Israel were forgiven, the thread would miraculously turn white. Now that was the legend. So in verse 19 he says, If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. How is the faithful city become an harlot? It is full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water. Thy princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth cause of the widow come unto them. Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. So the Lord is continually speaking here. And he says, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Zion is corrupted to be redeemed. How the faithful city has become a prostitute, idolatrous, despicable. She who was full of justice, right standings with God, once lodged in her, but now she's full of murderers. He says that their silver has turned to lead and their wine is diluted with water. So when he said that silver turned to dross, is turned to lead, sulfite. He said, your rulers are rebels and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and chases after gifts. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. Instead, they delay or turn a deaf ear. Therefore, the Lord God of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, declares that he will be freed of his adversaries and he will avenge himself on his enemies. Which brings us to the last few verses, six, I believe, beginning at verse 25. We're talking about rebellion of God's people. He says here in verse 25, And I will turn my hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy ten. And I will restore my judges as at the first and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterwards thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. So verse 25 to 27 the Lord is saying, again, speaking through the prophet Isaiah, I will turn my hand. God said he will turn his hand against them and will thoroughly purge away their dross, their silver, as with lye and remove all their ten impurities. Then God will restore their judges as at the first and their counselors as at the beginning. Afterwards, they will be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion will be redeemed with justice and her repentant ones with righteousness. So verse 28 says, and the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together and they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed for they shall be ashamed of the oath which ye have desired and ye shall be confounded for the gardens that ye have chosen. So verse 28 and 29, the Lord says, but rebels and sinners will be crushed and destroyed together and those who abandon turn away from the Lord will be consumed or will perish. And then the last verse, verse 29, it says, For they shall be ashamed of the oaks which ye have desired, and ye shall be confounded for the gardens that ye have chosen. For ye shall be as an oak whose leaf fadeth, and as a garden that hath no water. And the strong shall be as tow, and the maker of it as a spark. And they shall both burn together, and none shall quench them. So 29 to 31, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, verse 29 31, it says, For you, the nation of Israel, will be ashamed of the degradation of the oaks in which they took idolatrous pleasures, and they will be ashamed of the gardens of passion which they have chosen for pagan worship. For they will be like an oak 
whose leaf withers and dies, and like a garden that has no water, since the strong man will become tender, and his work a spark. So both will burn together, and there will be none to quench them or to put out the fire. That brings us to the end of our discussion on Isaiah chapter 1. I'll leave you with three words as I often do. Remember, say them with me, Jesus is Lord. God bless you.